This episode is sponsored by Vinny Tordrich and Peter Pardini's Fat, a documentary. Now available for pre-order on iTunes. I'm pissed off. The reasons that the ketogenic diet hasn't become more popular has nothing to do with efficacy at all. In the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, they recommend fewer calories, less fat, less saturated fat, less cholesterol. The history of science is full of commonsensical facts that turned out to be dead wrong when we did the science. Less sugar, less salt, more fiber. You're telling people what to do, how to do it, and everyone's just throwing their hands up going, I'm going to do the best I can. Myths have become ingrained in our society too strongly for people to realize they're myths. What are some of the health myths we hear every day? Grains are good for you and fat is bad for you. Calorie in, calorie out. The low-fat diet is a healthy diet. We saw fat in the coronary arteries. That must come from ingested fat. There's incontrovertible evidence that saturated fat is bad. Like hot oil down a cold stovepipe. It would just clog up your arteries and give you a heart attack. It doesn't take long for media to pick up on these things, and we don't realize it's happening, but it's happening right in front of us. I realized that we had gotten it completely upside down and backward on fat. Imagine someone who spent his whole career getting the wrong answer. Not only are you wrong, you're completely wrong. Imagine the press release you would have to write, Dear American public, we're sorry if we killed prematurely your loved ones and your parents and maybe we're killing you, but in retrospect we shouldn't have given the advice we did. If you think it's up to government, you're wrong. If you think it's up to industry, you're wrong. It's up to you. Click on the photo image to the left at fascinationstreetpod.com to take you directly to the iTunes pre-order page. I believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Welcome back, Streetwalkers. This episode is with visual effects expert and now director Josh Sutherland. In this episode, we talk about where he grew up and sort of what led him to get into the film business. And we talk about some of the work he did in the visual effects arena with such notable properties as Jack Reacher, Looper, The Avengers, X-Men, Pirates of the Caribbean, stuff like that. And then we transition into talking about his new feature film. It's called Chasing Molly, and it's not at all what you expect. No, it's not a sequel to Chasing Amy. But it is showing on Amazon Prime, and it is an hour and 20 minutes of fun and funny that you will enjoy. There's too many people in it to mention, but trust me, you're going to recognize most or all of them, and they do a great job with this film. So enjoy, folks. This is the director of Chasing Molly, Josh Sutherland. Welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, Josh Sutherland. How are you doing today, Josh? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, I'm happy to be here and excited to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, me and uh, my movie. It is very exciting for me as well. And we'll talk about your movie in just a little bit. But suffice it to say, the way that I found you was through the Twitter account for the movie, mm -hmm. uh, which I guess is run by the writer and the lead actress. Yeah. So... Josh, where were you born? Like, tell me where you were raised and whatnot, how you grew up, where you grew up. Yeah, so I actually grew up in Texas. Um, I was born in New Orleans, but, you know, I always, when people are like, where are you from? I mean, I've lived in L.A. for about 10 years now, and so I feel like I'm starting to get to that point where you're like, okay, I'm just from L.A. now, but it always be to me where you went to high school or where you grew up and went to grade school. And so that was Houston, uh, outside Houston, Texas for me. And my brother was born in Texas. My family's been in Texas. I actually have relatives that fought in the Alamo, fought in the Battle of San Jacinto. So Sutherland's have been in Texas for a long time, and that's um, where I'm happy to be from. Oh, very cool. I'm going to assume that you are out west currently? Yes, sir. So I actually uh, I currently live in 
Los Angeles. I've been out here for about 10 years. You know, I went to um, film school at the University of Texas and uh, was lucky enough to get an internship with a company that makes like all the Bourne movies, like Bourne Supremacy, Bourne Ultimatum. And so right after, right you know, as I was graduating, I went straight to uh, L.A. and just kind of stayed out here ever since. So literally been out here for just short of a decade now. So been grinding. Yeah, it sounds like. So you went to film school in Austin? Yeah, so I went to film school, uh, college of communication, University of Texas, you know, RTF degree and uh, specializing in film production. And so, um, you know, that's where I made all my first movies and stuff like that. I always tell people too, like, especially in this industry, like if you're, you know, a lawyer or a doctor, they want to know where you went to med school or law school. Um, filmmaking, it's not as important, but um, I definitely would recommend if you want to go to film school, it was definitely fun and, and it was definitely not only an investment in myself, but also just allowing me to make make a bunch of mistakes, right? Like that's where you get to really cut your teeth on like figuring out how to make films and, you know, get to make all those mistakes before um, it's truly like going to be a detriment to your career or something like that. What was your family's reaction when you told them that you wanted to get into the film business? Oh, but before you answer that, did you say RTF? Yeah, so... um the degree technically is radio, television, and film. So they kind of—it's all three. It's a college of communications, and it's traditionally like I know a lot of big universities, and they're, they're they'll be called RTF degrees. It's radio, television, and film. And generally, you kind of once you're in that school and going to go for that degree, you kind of then pick one to specialize in and go down that pathway. And so I was obviously film production, but it definitely was an RTF degree. Gotcha. Now for the millennials listening. Uh, the R in RTF stands for radio. And what that is, is <laughs> that is a, a fossil that comes with every car for some reason. So ask your parents about what an actual radio is, and then they'll, they'll fill you in. Yes. Before Spotify, before, before Pandora, before all that radio. Yes, folks, there was a before. So what, what did your parents say when you said you wanted to get into the film business? Man, my parents have been supportive in with me no matter you know what I wanted to do and so I was lucky enough you know to have parents that are definitely encouraging of that and even growing up like I tell people I've been making movies forever and it's because you know in fifth grade we had this little thing where it's called mini society where everyone in class is either making bookmarks or book covers or trying to sell stuff right and it's like a little monopoly type game to kind of teach you about economics and all that stuff well I made a movie <laughs> and with my family's camcorder editing it on VHS tapes, literally in our VCR, another old technology for you millennials out there, basically doing the cuts because you could record on that to a, to a separate tape when the camcorder is plugged into the TV. And so I made a little movie, you know, had a screening for my classmates, charged them tickets and got fake money to buy more stickers and bookmarks and stuff like that. So I've been making movies, you know, with our family camcorder and stuff like that. And I was always the kid in class that wanted to, you know, if you could make a movie for a project instead of writing an assignment or doing any paperwork, that was me. I'll always remember being, you know, I think I was 11 at the time. And my uncle, my parents were out of town. And my uncle was like, yo, I'm going to take you guys, me and my little brother, to this R-rated movie. Don't tell your mom. And that movie was The Matrix. And he was like, this movie, they learned Kung Fu for two years before they even started shooting it just so they could get it right. And I want you guys to see it. And it blew my mind as an 11 year old. And so, you know, I, I feel like I've been making movies forever. And luckily my parents have, you know, graced me by being supportive and giving me a camcorder and all that and letting me just kind of, kind of figure it out. So that's um, super cool. Well, that is definitely a groundbreaking movie. So yeah, it makes sense that that would be so impactful to your career. Mm hmm. So you graduate from film school in Austin, and then you get this internship with Jason Bourne. <laughs> what were you doing during that internship? Were you a PA? Like, were you getting coffee, or what were you doing? Yeah, there was some getting coffee, for sure. If you're the intern, you're probably getting coffee no matter what you're doing. But really cool, it was for a company called Captivate Entertainment, and they actually represent Robert Ludlow, who wrote all the novels. And so they actually you know, are more involved in the pre-production, right? So that's the scripts. You know, anything in pre-production is set up for all the Bourne movies and, and working with Paul Greengrass, you know, all the writers and directors of who that whole franchise. And so I was lucky enough to, to get that intern. And my main goal 
when I was looking for interns, it was like, oh, I want to be on a lot. I want to be on a lot somewhere. I want to get on one of these big studio Hollywood lots in Los Angeles before I go out there. And Captain Entertainment was on the lot at Universal. Their office was. I don't know where they're at now, but it was so cool to literally drive on the Universal lot every day as just you know someone fresh to LA. And so I didn't mind if I was getting coffee, driving, or, you know, getting meals for whoever. But it was a lot of script coverage, so I was actually reading a lot of new scripts. You know, it's kind of like a book report. You read the script, you write your thoughts, you kind of think what what were the best parts, what were the worst parts, and kind of give a summary. And then you hand that off with the script to the more creative executives and people further up. And that's kind of like, you know, a lot of companies for pre-production, that's kind of the first door in, right? Is like they have all these um, lower level people kind of reading these scripts to kind of parse through them and search through and find the ones that they should actually spend their time actually reading because they get so many submissions. And so that's primarily what I was doing. My very, very first internship in L.A. was doing that. So how did you go from that to visual effects? Yeah, so luckily, like, my internship ended, and I had been freelancing for a couple of weeks, right? Like, I've always had cameras. I've always been a shooter and making my own stuff and doing music videos and just anything that would pay me. And so I got a call from a visual effects company, and they were actually making their very first feature film that, that they were doing themselves internally, and they needed a key. They needed a set PA. And I was like, this is perfect. I would love to be on a feature film and on set. This is exactly what I want to do. And so luckily they hired me and I got on set for that. And that was a movie in 2009 called Skyline. It was like aliens sucking people out of the sky, if anyone remembers that movie. And um, luckily crushed it on set. And they were like, hey, we'd love to have you in the office for the VFX company now that the movie's wrapping. And I was like, great, steady work. This will be a steady paycheck. Like, it's not freelance and it's not so much being on set anymore. Um, but I, I'd love to continue this and see where it goes because I seem to really like VFX. And that turned into, you know, me being at that company called uh, Hydraulics Visual Effects for about five more years. And luckily started on set for them, then was at the front desk for a brief period of time, then was a VFX editor for them, then was managing... You know, we had a huge green screen stage with about nine cameras and lenses and mountain of gear. And then it turned into me, you know, managing all the stage stage resources and all the rentals. And um, basically, any time they would go to set, uh, I would get to go and I would get to um, help. And not, then it started turning to me then shooting for them and me doing sound and basically learning every single aspect of and crew position on uh, films and filmmaking. So uh, that's how that came about. But it was super, super cool because, you know, as a visual effects owner, the best way to explain it to people who don't understand is like, you, know, you understand when you see a Hollywood movie and you see the VFX start, maybe you don't because you've walked out by then. But when the names start going by the screen, there's a mountain of people who work on these movies, especially in the visual effects department. And so... As a visual effects editor, that means for that company, you are getting the edit from the actual movie. And as the shots come in, you drop them into the sequence. So that way the supervisors can sit in the theater and be like, oh, all these have to match. Whether it's like, for example, if it's like for X-Men and Cyclops shooting a beam through five shots, they want to see those five shots all back to back so that they can make sure that it's the same in all the shots and it matches and it works with the cut and all this. So my job was to sit and recreate those cuts and bring in the shots and show them to the supervisors, but not only them, the clients, right? So we would have some really, really big producers and directors come over and I'm in the theater getting to show them their shots and get to see them critique them and get to sit and watch the effects and figure out what looks good, what's wrong with the shot, how is it working, how is it not, and then the flip side of that is I would also get to go to set when we go to set because a lot of times we're shooting VFX elements, whether like a shot needs burning hair or flames or something on green screen. It's like I would get to shoot that. I would get to help light that. If it needed sound, I would sometimes do sound. And so it really was cool. It's kind of like a second level of, of film school that you're getting paid for, right? Because I got to learn so many cool crew positions. And not only that, but get to see some very high-level VFX and luckily got some credits on some very, very huge movies. Well, you did get to work on some very huge movies. Just as a visual effects person, I mean, the list is 
probably billions of dollars worth of box office. You got Pirates of the Caribbean, The Avengers, X Men, mm-hmm. Looper. Good lord, Jack Reacher. Yeah, so the, the, super cool. Like it's a very high level VFX company, very high level clients. Luckily, when these big VFX houses, you know, if you're one of the leads, then you not only get to do stuff after the fact in post production, but you actually get to do stuff before as well as like taking a bunch of like uh, stills on set to recreate stuff and camera positions and stuff like that. So I got to be on set for some very, very big movies too, like with the VFX team, you know, during production. So, you know, like San Andreas and um, some big, big Hollywood level movies. And so just been, been stashing away all this knowledge and kind of seeing how super independent movies work that I've been making and all the way up to, you know, two hundred million dollar blockbusters. So it all comes together eventually. I'll say. Yeah. So you said you get to do things like pre production. What kind of things? So specifically, like like that one company, we um, they not only work on huge effects movies, but they also create their own movies, right? And so I got to not only as far as pre production and the planning goes, it's mainly script, like we're saying the script coverage, but prepping all the gear, packing all the gear, making carnets. You know, before I, I left that company towards the end of my tenure, we did as the second, you know, version of Skyline, uh, Beyond Skyline. It was a sequel. And that one was actually primarily shot in Indonesia. And so got to, you know, be over in Indonesia for four months and was a uh, DIT and playback on that crew. So it was, it was uh, definitely kind of a little full circle moment for me to be on that first Skyline, which was the first movie they made, and be key set PA. And then the second one, I've moved up a little bit and I'm DIT, and that's the person who is responsible for all the media from all the cameras. And we had six six cameras on set, so it was uh, definitely a challenge. So um, what led you to uh, direct? Man, so I mean, I've been obviously just directing as much as I can, right? Just making, goes back to making movies is wanting to create your own, your own content and be in charge of the creative decisions with all that. And so, you know, whether that was school projects leading to, you know, shorts and film school to more shorts after film school and stuff like that is, you know, I, I've been writing and directing in my mind, my whole, my whole career. It's pretty obviously hard and challenging to get other people to give you money to then see see that through and get to direct bigger stuff. And so just been literally for, you know, the past decade in Los Angeles, been like grinding and grinding away and trying to direct as much as I can. And and in this industry, unfortunately, people want to pigeonhole you all the time, whether, you know, it's like, oh, you're just a sound guy or, oh, you're just a gaffer, you're a grip, you're whatever. But I think, you know, me, much like everyone else, has higher aspirations. and, um, And some people do want to just be the best DP in the world or do want to be just the gaffer on the biggest movies and stuff. And, you know, my dream has been to create my own content and to direct as, as much as I can. And so um, this month specifically, I've been feeling truly, truly blessed to finally have, you know, a feature film out that says my name as director at the end of it. And um, it's been uh, it's been a challenge, but it, it, that makes it more, that much more rewarding. So let's talk about your film. Mm-hmm. It's called Chasing Molly, and I watched it last night on Amazon Prime. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Demon cleaners, cleansing house, body, and soul. If they said we'll be back, then they'll definitely be back. Where is the doll now? Guestimate. Did the doll ask you to play a game? Never say yes to a doll's game. Was it like a ooh, or more like, your mother's a in hell? Okay, the first one. Okay, great. We had this incident the other night. You see my face, kid. You're already dead. <laughs> I can't see. It's not like anyone got murdered here. You see my mother's teapot? I stashed the last bit of pills in there. We're going to be waterboarded. I am not a strong swimmer. I just, where are you? Great story, Molly. I'm in a bit of a predicament. Sus huevosis. A fuerte y grande y limpia. You say I have strong, big, clean balls? Yep. Yeah. Back once again, what the hell are you doing? It's, uh, you've never heard of a honey facial? Back once again. You ever seen a bee with a wrinkle? No. No. You haven't. I haven't. You know, pearls are uh, the gossip girls of the sea. You uh, hold one up to your ear, you can hear sounds from the ocean. I think you mean seashells? No, no, no. A pearl's going to tell you things a seashell won't. I got three different kids from three different women. Get me pregnant and leave. What's your name, sweetheart? Melanie Mellon. No. The name your poor excuse for parents gave you. Trinity. 
Sorry, you never had a chance, did you? Andy's ready to get grapefruited. This man go! You let him Peter Pan you! What's being Peter Panned? It's when you play with a stinker belt until he flies. Everybody go check out Chasing Molly. Now, I did something a little bit cruel to my son, who's 26. I texted him last night and said, hey, guess what? I get, I'm, tomorrow I'm going to interview the director of a film that starts with Chasing and ends in Y. <laughs> and he called me instantly and was like, what the hell? How come you didn't tell me? How come I'm like, calm down, calm down. <laughs> Yeah, no, if I could be half as big as Kevin Smith, that'd be a dream come true. Well, he's lost a lot of weight. You probably are. <laughs> you know, you might be as big as him now. He's lost a lot of weight. He has. You know, Mall Rats, James Silent Bob. I'm, I'm a huge Kevin Smith fan. So Chasing Amy uh, is definitely a, a very great movie. And I can't speak to that as much our, our movie is definitely not chasing amy but unfortunately you know a lot of people have been like oh is this a sequel to chasing amy or blah blah, blah. And so because the name is very tongue-in-cheek and close to that but uh, unfortunately we're not involved with them at all but um that is definitely a cruel cruel joke to pull on your son yes uh he was not happy so like i said i did watch this this film and i guess the lead actress is also the writer of the film how did you get involved with uh, Shelly Pack? Yeah, so Shelly is a very dear, close friend of mine, obviously my producing partner. You know, we both wrote the story. She's a machine and wrote the script, and um, she's the main star of the movie and plays the character, Molly, the central character in the, in the film. But we got together maybe seven years ago. Like, we actually made a short film called Dashiell, A Journey Through Autism. And uh, Shelly, you know, not only is a creator, but also likes to give her time to helping, you know, special needs kids, specifically children with autism, and, you know, also just helps the homeless and does so much stuff, humanitarian work like that, in between gigs and jobs and stuff, that we got together and, you know, she was like, I really have this one student that I want to make this documentary about. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm a filmmaker and I would love to direct stuff, so let's let's talk about it. And, uh, you know, through that, we met, we talked, we actually ended up shooting the documentary, you know, she Shelly, it was just a documentary short, by the way. And uh, Shelly, you know, I, I kind of use the term I go and say, like, bless her heart, but she, you know, sent that little documentary everywhere. And so I would get emails, maybe every couple of weeks, and it'd be like, like oh, Dashiell's playing at such and such festival in Istanbul, Turkey, or Dashiell got into this festival in Russia, Dashiell got into you know, all over. And so literally every month she would just send it out everywhere. Every short doc fest, pretty much she would submit it to. And that movie probably played in like 30 different countries around the world. And so that only, not only proved to me like how much she cares about her projects, but also that she won't take no for an answer, right? Like she's going to get that movie seen no matter what happens. And so we made that it played a lot of places and we felt like that was a success. And then after that, we basically made an LLC together to try to package another script that Shelly had um, with bigger talent to be a feature. And that can basically, we had investors fall through with the money a couple of times. And so we were like, let's write something else that we know we can shoot ourselves and do it ourselves without any money. And that basically turned into Chasing Molly. So, if I'm correct, I guess the male lead in that film, uh, Atticus, that's the guy who's trying to take Flo's job on the progressive commercials, right? <laughs> yeah, Jim Cashman, he's amazing, man. Jim is so funny. He is Jamie in all the progressive ads, and if you watch your TV at all, if you watch cable at all, you will see him so much, and I'm so happy for him, and I'm so glad that he, you know, he's a personal friend of Shelley's and came and did the movie for us and uh, is not only extremely funny, but if you know anything about the industry as well, you probably know that commercial work pays so much more than probably feature work if you're not like a huge star. And so every time I see him, I see him on those ads and they're, they're running everywhere. I'm talking like, you know, in the middle of the finals and crazy games and on multiple networks. And it, it's um, super, super awesome for Jim. I'm so, so happy for him. 
Well, he did a great job. And I do know that if you get in good on an ad campaign, you know, like like Jamie or Flo, you probably don't need to do anything else. And so I think it's really cool that he went ahead and, and did your, your film and he was great in it. Yep. Can I ask, and you don't have to tell me, but can I ask what was the budget for this film? I'll just say it's extremely, extremely low. We made the movie um, with the intention of doing it ourselves, which is the wrong way to make a feature film. I'll just say that. We had the idea of like, I own really nice camera gear and I also own really nice sound gear. And I always told myself, I'm like, we have the tools. We have the tools just sitting here at our disposable. How can we package something that no one can tell us no, that you can't make this just like our other script that we're trying to get funding for. And so me and Shelly literally wrote the story specifically with the intention of being able to pick it off on like weird nights and weekends, because a traditional film shoot is, you know, that has a bunch of, but a big budget shoots maybe 45, 60 days back to back, right? You're just shooting one day after another. They shoot the movie all out of order because they can, and it helps the schedule and yada, yada, yada. We strategically wrote the script for Chasing Molly so that we could pick it off on random nights and weekends or whenever we could get the crew together to do it. So that meant that basically it was going to be like a run the gauntlet type story. It takes place like in a day, a night in a day. Uh, I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but like the main characters, there's a couple outfit changes, but primarily they wear mostly the same stuff. And that just put us in a situation to win, right? To make sure we could do this. I have the talent show up to set. They really wear the same thing all the time. All our vocations are around LA. It also let us reach out. We set a rule for ourselves where the main two characters, Jim's character, Atticus, and Shelly's character, Molly, if they're in another scene with someone else, that person doesn't, they, they do reoccur later, but we our goal was to shoot that third person out in a day. And what that allowed us to do is we could reach out to mid-level talent and be like, hey, we know the game. But we're, we promise we're going to wrap you out in one day or we're never going to have callbacks. We're not going to like need you for multiple days back to back. There's going to be one location, st- stuff like that. It basically put us in a position to win so that we could go to these people and, and become way more approachable and get way more yeses. And it also put us in a situation where, for example, it might be two weeks before we do scenes and it's like, oh, you don't need a scripty on site, right? You don't need continuity as much. You don't need certain key crew members that are essential for filmmaking process when you're shooting it all out of order and all jumbled, but back to back, you can kind of mitigate some of those costs. And so that was the main goal. And so literally we took the script and kind of went through it and broke it down. And we're like, okay, what is just like Molly in? Well, we can go get that ourselves whenever we want. What is Molly and Jim and uh, Atticus in? All right, well, we know we can get Atticus, and like, let's get those scenes knocked out. And we literally just cross it off. And so literally every time we do a shoot, whether it was one day apart, whether it was a week apart, I would dump it uh, and dump the footage on my computer, and it'd be day one, right? And then no matter when the next time we shot was, that's day two. It ended up all in all being about 32 days of shooting, but that definitely took a year and a half. And I will say that this is not the traditional way to make a feature film, but I'm not only happy, but super just impressed with us that there is a cohesive story that we did finish it. And like it put us in a situation, like I said, where there's no one there saying no, and there's nobody telling us like how to do something. We, so the budget is extremely low. That That's what I'll say. At the beginning of that answer, you said that you guys intentionally set out to do it by yourselves. And then you also said that that's not a good idea or that's not the right way to do it. Why not? It sounds like it worked out fine and it may have taken a long time, but you got a great product. Sure. And and specifically what I mean is like with like we were like our other project, we're waiting and waiting and waiting to try to get money, try to get other producers and stuff involved. And so this was when I say by ourselves, it, it, it means like without another outside executive producers, outside executive studios or forces um, having creative control. But 
there is no way we made this movie with just me and Shelly. Obviously, we called in all the favors. And so, t- like, point blank, filmmaking is a team sport. And people think, like, oh, you know, if you're, you're just Quentin Tarantino or whatever director, like, you just have a vision and you get it done. It's like, no, no, no. Like, 100%, if you look at, there's a reason why the credits at the end of these movies are so long. Every name on there is very important and it is a very specialized role, you know. And that's why I tell people all the time, it's like, get out there and help your friends make movies. Because if you make movies, you generally have friends that want to make movies and you're all making movies together. And you need to be out there holding the boom mic for them, holding a bounce board, helping load gear, do whatever, because eventually you're just stacking all those favors. And eventually, right, you're going to have your passion project and you're going to need someone to do something for you. And that's when you get to call in all those favors. And so this one, we definitely called in all the favors. And luckily, Shelly is very, very high level improviser, knows a bunch of comedians in the improv community. And we, like I said, we structured the script, structured the project to put ourselves in a situation where we reached out to those people. They could, in fact, do the project. It's not like, oh, we need you for a week long. There's 10 company moves and you have these other obligations. So definitely couldn't have done it, just me and Shelly, but we did. (laughs) Well, like I said, I think y'all did a great job. Hey, streetwalkers. Well, you're not literally streetwalkers. But now that I've got your attention, I am Stephen O'Reilly, and I have a podcast called The Bar Star Podcast. And since you're listening to the Fascination Street Podcast, I think you should check out my show. It's just as interesting without all the famous people, because Steve has connections that I just do not have. But if you dig podcasts about music, working musicians, and other random shit that I decided to talk about based around music, of course, because that's what I do. I'm a working musician for the past 30 years. Then you need to check out the Bar Star podcast. You can get it wherever you get your podcast on any platform and make sure you check out barstarpodcast.com. Now back to the one and only Steve Owens and whatever the hell he was talking about. I do want to say, without giving anything away, the first time that we see the Latino gang, Mm -hmm. the conversation that they're having made me have to pause the movie because I was laughing so hard I couldn't hear what they were saying. (laughs) That was hilarious. Well done. Thanks. Yeah, those guys were so, so funny and so cool on set. And we actually have a bunch more with them that didn't actually end up making it in the movie. But just to, to talk about, like, when you're making this, you don't know, right? Like we, most some movies you go in knowing you have distribution lined up or you've pre-sold some territories or stuff like that. Ours, we're just, we're just making it and hoping to have something to sell at the end. Right. And so nothing was sold. And so we kind of plan to structure some of these smaller minor roles with people who have big social media followings. That way, in case we didn't get distribution and we had to self distribute it online, we'd have some social media people to kind of like blast it out. And so that main kind of the gang leader, his name is uh, Scar, and he's got some very uh, interesting tattoos and stuff. But he he is very very big in a social like viral videos called Cholo's Try. And if you've never seen those, um, they're very funny on YouTube. And um, that's actually how we found him and reached out to him. And same thing, like got him to uh, come be in our scenes, and uh, they did a great job. So you're going to tell me that uh, his tattoos are real? <laughs> every tattoo is re- every tattoo in that scene on everybody is real, uh, for sure. So definitely some, some commitment to get some of those tattoos. That's hilarious. Now, one of the things that used to be sort of, I guess, all, it happened all the time, maybe in the 80s and sometimes early in the 90s, is after cards. And so at the end of the film you would see, you know, like sort of a picture and then a little description of what that character went on to do after the time that's depicted in the film. And this movie did that. <laughs> the, some of those after cards were hilarious. <laughs> oh, man. I'll just say me and Shelly went back and forth a bunch sitting there trying to figure out like what the physical text on some of those jokes should be. Because 
I'll just say, like, the movie is very, very raunchy, right? Like, I know we are right in the line between acceptable and inappropriate, for sure. And so there are some of those cards, you know, we were, we were calling them, like, the where are they nows. And so those where are they now moments at the end of the movie, definitely out there. And I'm glad you found some of those funny. They were really funny. And as far as, I guess, some of the, the banter and some of the dialogue in the film being, you know, on the verge of out of bounds... I think that what helped it even appear more on the verge or on the line was the delivery of the people saying those lines. Because for the most part, they did them straight. You know, there wasn't Mm. a smirk or a comedic bent. Like, they delivered them as straight lines. And these ridiculous sentences and phrases coming out of the straight man's face (laughs) or the straight woman's face really, really, I think, furthered the gravity and the the gotcha moment, sort of the holy shit, did they really just say that right. of, of the whole thing? Yeah, and, I, and like, we were blessed, right? Blessed to have a bunch of, you know, high-level improvisers, high-level comedians that were able to deliver that. And so, you know, a lot of main cast groundlings guys, a lot of former UCB people. And so even, you know, like the pawn shop character, everyone, right? And, and Felicia Day killed it. Kurt Angle killed it. We knew going in at the writing, uh, yeah, some of these lines are a little out there, and, and they delivered for sure. And, uh, of course, not to leave out Jeff Lewis, who also killed it. And oh, man. every time a character came on the screen, I found myself going, holy shit, it's that person from that thing. So I very well done. And like you said, I'm sure that, you know, part of it was, you know, reaching out to friends and, and asking for favors. And part of it was specifically selecting people with a, a heavy social media influence. You picked and got to agree some iconic actors and actresses uh, who will be known uh, you know, in their roles for time memoriam, <laughs> time in memoriam. Like you picked some, some great, great folks. Well done on that. Thank you. Yeah. And it, and it definitely was a team effort uh, with me and Shelly. And yeah, I mean, I can't speak more highly than I already have of saying like all of our actors definitely came to bring it. We knew that our movie is, you're not doing our movie for any sort of money or paycheck or anything like that. It's literally because you enjoy acting or you thought it was funny or you want it, you know, you, you definitely wanted to be there. And so we were lucky enough to have those type of people on set, which is key. Well, um, hats off to you and Shelly and to uh, everybody who was a part of the film who made that happen. It was very well done. And how long has that been on Amazon prime? How long has it been released? Yeah. So it came out on May 7th. So it's been about four weeks now tomorrow. And I will say the first like wave window is three or four months of basically VOD everywhere. So it's available on almost every single cable platform. If you can buy a movie through your TV and don't have Dish, literally we're Cox, Spectrum, Time Warner, all of them. So if you can buy a movie through your TV, you can get it. If you can get it online, Amazon, Vudu, Fandango, Redbox, all those. Uh, and then the DVDs are everywhere too. It's best by Walmart, Target, uh, Amazon. So Wait, you have physical copies? There are physical copies still, just like this ancient technology called radio. There are uh, Blu-rays and DVDs available on Amazon. And like I said, I think it's like Target, Walmart, Barnes & Nobles, Best Buy, stuff like that. Now, this is going to sound like a really, really, maybe even insulting, but I don't mean it. Question, why physical copies? For me specifically, I'm not sure how many you know DVDs I'm buying a lot of to watch like that. But there definitely is a big still market for that in different parts of North America. And really? it's once we sold the movie, um, you know, our distribution company wanted to, to pursue that. And so we're totally on board with getting our movie seen with obviously as many people as possible. So it's out there as well in DVD and Blu-ray form. Now that is really cool. And I obviously did not see that coming. I'm just blown away. That's so cool. I mean, in the day and age where, Beyonce, I don't even think she puts out physical CDs. <laughs> yeah. You know, and she's like the she's the, the biggest female singer in the world. Jay-Z just hit a billion dollars last month or whatever. And I can't imagine that he puts out c- physical CDs. Yeah, I mean, we were, I was, I mean, it's definitely a cool feeling to see, like, I can't even remember the name of the actual store, but on our 
the places where it's at. There's definitely, it's in some rental stores in the Midwest. It's in, you know, the DVD and obviously it's super cool that we blasted that out and to pre-order all that stuff. And just a really cool feeling like three or four weeks ago, getting, uh, you know, that photo with my parents holding my DVD was pretty special. That is dope as shit. Now, I'm sorry to keep doing this, but did you say a rental store? Yes. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, not a, obviously, no more blockbusters exist, and that's why I can't even remember the name of the store, but there's definitely a chain of stores in the Midwest that has Chasing Molly for rent, and I wish I could tell you the exact name of it. I think it's home video or something, but yeah, I was kind of shocked when I saw that one on the list of everywhere that the movie's available, but uh I have more more power to them. I appreciate Gravitas uh, and the the work they're doing for our movie and getting it out there. That is awesome. And uh, just so you know, there is still one blockbuster location, and I think it's somewhere in Oregon. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, how did you get hooked up with Gravitas, or was that all Shelley and her tenacity? Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of her tenacity, right? Like we finished the movie probably in July of last year, and it very well could have been, you know, we, I'll first say we had some preliminary connections, right. To, we knew we could at least get it seen at a couple of distribution places without having to have a sales agent. Cause normally you have to have a sales agent to get it, even get it seen, but you're, you're essentially losing a little piece of equity, right. To that sales agent. And so we knew we had a couple connections that we could get, at least get it seen without a sales agent. And there literally is a, a chance that they're just like, hey, good job, guys. Keep keep making movies. And pat on the back. Like, keep trying. And so we started emailing it out to those people. And then there we had some positive responses. So that, you know, encouraged us to then send it to everyone else and be like, hey, we've sent this to here and they've made an offer. Would you like to check it out? And they would. And so literally we had about 10 offers by about August uh, on the film. And we ended up going with a company called Gravitas Ventures in about November and signed with them. And they, they told us it'd be out May 7th and it's out everywhere now. And it's been kind of a whirlwind year for us. It's probably also a silly question, but what made you choose Gravitas? Was it the deal or was it the foothold they have on the market? Yeah, no, it's definitely more the foothold than the deal, right? Uh, um, point blank, there was a little bit better offer on the table, but to us specifically for me and Shelly, right? Like, like I said, we have, we have other projects. We have, uh, in our opinion, a, a very funny script with even bigger talent verbally attached that we want to get out there. We just need investors and investors have fallen through a bunch. And so we need to Molly really to be more of like a calling card, right? Like if this is movie is not to line my pockets in any way, unfortunately um, it's really to make another movie. And so we felt and we believe Gravitas was the best way to go to get it seen by as many people as possible. Well, I think that was a smart decision. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Now, Josh, can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media? Yeah, of course. So I'm primarily on Instagram, but Twitter and Facebook as well. And it's at Sutherland Film. So at S-U-T-H-E-R-L-A-N-D-F-I-L-M. I post, like I said, most of my stuff to Instagram, but I direct primarily commercially for a company called OM Digital, and we work on some super cool stuff. Uh, so I post most of that stuff up there if you want to check out ever what I'm working on. Very cool. As we're heading out, first of all, thank you for your time. Was there anything that I didn't ask or that we didn't talk about that you wanted to talk about? Yeah, so I mean, I just want to speak a little bit more, um, speak to Kurt Angle specifically, if you're interested in that. I mean, Kurt, on, I just want to say Kurt, when we reached out to Kurt, like me primarily and Shelly were talking about the character for Mr. Black. And I really wanted, you know, a big, muscly, big kind of loud talking personality. And I was like, why don't we look at some like WWE wrestler type people or wrestlers so that way they might be more apt to do our movie <laughs> because it's a movie. And we had some other names floating around that we were reaching out to. And then she suggested Kurt Angle. And I kind of like literally had a laugh out loud moment that I was like, I don't know if he'd be into this, knowing what the script and the, some of the lines in here. And luckily, we it, it was literally almost a cold call, right? Like we send the script to his manager. A couple of days later, they said Kurt likes it. He actually read it and he really likes it and wants to do this. And I was blown away. And 
we were connected with his agents and basically figured it all out. And, you know, a couple of weeks later, Kurt's in LA for a day and a half for us to, to shoot him out. And so it was really a dream come true. And that's been like the story with this whole movie, man. I keep kind of saying there's like a little snowball, right? That you're kind of rolling up a mountain and it quietly is just slowly turns into an avalanche. Having a legend like Kurt Angle on set, he was such a pleasure to have and um, he crushed his scene. Like, I mean, one example of that is, you know, once we have him locked, we're like, what's your, let's send us some sizes. We'll get your wardrobe, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, no, I'd rather wear one of my personal, you know, tailored suits. And we're like, okay, but you know, the scene is going to involve such and such. And then, you know, cut to him on set and we have him in this like dingy, the dirtiest of LA back alleys. And he's literally laying on the ground. Like, you know, if you, I don't want to give anything away, but in the final scene, he's on the ground laying and like rolling and, and, and didn't even bat an eye. He was totally down for whatever we wanted and wanted to give us the character that we definitely wanted to have on screen. So I can't speak highly enough to how great Kurt Angle was. He's a legend and I'll forever be in his debt. Um, for sure, for doing this movie. And uh, same thing with Felicia. I mean, Felicia Day, she crushed it. Obviously, her scene is extremely awkward, too, and the lines are so funny, and she's a personal friend of Shelley's, and just getting her to come out and and do our our film for us was um, a dream come true. That's, That's pretty much the bulk of it. I do want to point out that in addition to some of the, the funny dialogue and, and things like that, there are some some visual gags that really, really work well. There's one with uh, with Kurt where, you know, just the sheer size of him uh, holding this this particular object, this sort of dainty, <laughs> dainty object is quite comical, just visually all by itself. And then uh, Felicia there's something there's a physical thing that she does in the car <laughs> which <laughs> is pretty fucking funny. Yeah. It's funny visually and then you can just barely hear what makes it even funnier. Yeah, the audio sets it off for sure and she was totally game for all of that when we asked her to do that and she was like, "Yeah, of course." And we're like, "Okay, this is going to be awesome." And so um that was literally the story for the the whole movie, right? Like getting these people just to come on board and just take our movie to the next level. And every step of the way, it kind of just became this bigger and bigger and bigger thing. And so, you know, it's not lost on me that like selling a movie is super hard. It's one of the hardest things I feel like in the world to do. And I, I've obviously been in the industry for a long time and um, know a lot of people who can make a movie, but knowing, knowing a lot of people who can sell a movie is a whole different ball game. And uh, we're super stoked to have Gravitas um, pick up our film and share it with the world. And if you support independent cinema, please check out our film. We'd really appreciate it. Actually, even if you don't support independent cinema, watch this movie out of pure selfishness. Yes. You will enjoy it, I promise. Now, Josh Sutherland, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day and your hectic schedule to let us get to know you a little bit better on Fascination Street. I really appreciate your time. And, you know, thank you for making this film, which which brought me an hour and 20 minutes of, of laughter last night. So thank you again. I appreciate that. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Everybody, please share the episode and blast out to your friends. And uh, obviously, Fascination Street podcast. Word. Thanks a lot, Josh. You have a great weekend. You too. Bye bye. Hey guys, this is Steve Owens from Fascination Street Podcast here with a very important message. I'm awesome. I bet you thought I was going to say something else, but nope. What's important here is that I am awesome. I started this show because I truly believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear those stories. In the short time I've been doing this show, I've interviewed actors, directors, writers, inventors, podcasters, musicians, pro athletes, Olympic athletes, actual war heroes, even a Bond girl and a luthier, whatever the hell that is, and of course, regular people. From people who wanted to be stars but never gave it a real try, to big company CEOs and people who got to meet their favorite president. I love getting to meet and speak with people who have a story to tell. I feel like everyone does, and it's my job to get them to tell it. You never know who my next guest will be. An Academy Award winning actor, a platinum selling musician, or your own mother-in-law. But one thing is for certain, you will be fascinated by their story. So come take a walk with me down Fascination Street. You can find Fascination Street Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, 
and of course, FascinationStreetPod.com. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2014 album Intransigence. Used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is Apollo from the 2001 album Into the Known by the band Sapphire. Thanks for hanging out with us and getting to know a little bit about our guest. We'll see you next time on Fascination Street.